Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the HGC Western Clash for 2017. Are you excited for Heroes of the Storm? <laughs> Rubbish. Terrible, terrible. And there's so many of you out there. Are you ready for some more Heroes of the Storm? <laughs> much better, much better. Good, OK, good. Three matches left now here to crown our champion for the first time in 2017 in the Western Clashes. And there are, of course, four teams still remaining. We know one of our grand finalists. It's time now to eliminate another team in the lower bracket. Our two teams next up have been fighting hard through that lower bracket. One has been very unfamiliar indeed, but one perhaps didn't even expect to be here at the HGC Western Clash. Our first team out, a teammate. Preparing for IAM Katowice was uh, pretty interesting. We're a pretty young team. This is obviously our first LAN event. So going into this event, I'd say like our biggest style and preparation is we wanted to get as good at standard play as possible. Uh, the upcoming matchups between Europe and North America, for me, uh, I guess my opinion's different than what most people in the community have, but I think that Europe overall is the stronger region right now. For us to perform well, it's our first land as a team. Uh, the biggest factor, honestly, is just drafting what we're comfortable playing. And We've been focusing really hard on broadening what that is, but that's the number one factor. We have to be comfortable on stage or else we won't perform. Ladies and gentlemen, the last surviving North American team. Please welcome Team 8. They are in do or die. It's win or go home. So, as we head into our second team, they are a brilliant team from 2016, triple European champions. However, they found themselves in unfamiliar territory in the lower bracket. They are Team Dignitas. Last year, I am Katowice, we actually won it. So to come back here again for a big Heroes tournament where we have a real shot winning feels great. I've seen the stage, it looks even better than last year, so I'm really excited to get on there and play. really hard for this event. We boot camped in Berlin in the Case King boot camp and that was a really positive experience for our team. It was the first time with this lineup of five that we've really gotten to be together in person and really just work towards improving. I think the favorites of this tournament are the big three from Europe. So we've got Misfits who are probably most people's expectation. I personally don't agree with that so much. Uh, Fnatic, obviously a very strong team as well and us, Team Dignitas. The big difference for us in this tournament is that we're bringing a coach. We recently brought on Dunk Train to try out as our coach, and so far it's been a really positive experience, and I think that's going to be the end that we need. Ladies and gentlemen, the champions of Katowice in 2016, Team Dignitas! Day three of the Western Clash. 
and four teams remain. Those teams mostly as expected, three from Europe and one from North America, although some questioned who that NA team would be. Team Dignitas topped the standings in the region. Gale Force Esports promised surprise, but it was quietly Team 8 who were able to make it to this point playing their own game. But to go any farther, they must defeat a European team. The silver lining, they have taken one game off of Dignitas before. Grubby, what do Team 8 need to do to actually win this series versus Team Dignitas? Well, Gilly, basically continue what they have been doing. They've come here in a battling mode. They've probably played better than they ever have before. They've already taken a map from Team Dignitas. It was only a 1-2. It's a best of five now. They've shown excellent draft diversity so far. Keep doing what you're doing and figure out the puzzle. Now, Trixler, we look at Europe and we saw the might of Europe in the last series. But Team Dignitas has not always shown to be that strong as Misfits and Fnatic. What do you believe they need to be able to do to close out this series and not just close it out, but do so confidently? Uh, I think the thing that Dignitas is missing compared to the top two is they don't have as much variety. Um, not to call out Mene, I think the team as a whole really like, enjoys having more mage-based compositions, but I need some variety in that regard. And I know he can play it. We've seen Zul'jin in the past, we've seen Bala from him in the past as well, but they seem to really falter around this idea of we have to have a mage on our compositions. If Team 8 can pick up on that, they might be able to score a few more wins this, this entire series. Toucher, you have been commentating at Team Dignitas and the, the members of them forever, and you know them quite well. What are you looking from them individually? Individually, I think we definitely have an incredible team in terms of star player potential. Everyone has the potential to come out and do well, but like Trick said, we need to see maybe a little bit more variety from a couple of the players. Some people on Twitter have been calling out Bakery. Personally, I disagree with that. He is basically almost unburnoutable as a support at this point. But Mena, we know he likes his mages. And Zalia, he is the newest member to the team, but he has such incredible star power and such incredible potential with his individual mechanics that if they can get him into a situation where maybe he increases hero pool or just make him more comfortable, he could be the factor that gets them into that top two or top one position. Great points you make. And hero diversity is not just an issue that maybe Team Dignitas is dealing with. It's one that we have talked about up here at the desk before for teammate as well. Question for the table. Same, but on the other side, what are you looking for individually? Are there any members now, because we have four new members to an international event for Team 8, anyone who is standing out at this point? Well, I think uh, Team 8's uh, Ragnaros player, Prisma, he's been doing a fantastic job at Ragnaros. Now, it is very obvious that he's comfortable there uh, when he can get that hero in particular. There's a very heavy prioritization for a, a Liming, a Ragnaros, and a Zeratul type of play from Team 8. And if they can get those, they are very comfortable. But they are also target bannable to a degree. For me, it's Justing. Uh, I feel like Justing has shown himself up as a premier warrior for the North American scene. It used to be Fury that I looked at the most. Now I'm starting to get my eyeball on Justing uh, for a certain reason or two. But let's look at this battleground phase real quick. Tetra Battlefield of Eternity will be our first battleground of this best of five. This elimination match. They're all elimination matches from here on out. This is, a, this is a map that we've actually seen in the previous series of these two teams, which a lot of us thought was maybe a little bit more Team 8 favored, due to the fact Team 8 seemed to like those smaller battlegrounds, those two-lane battlegrounds, a bit more. And just to expand on what Trixayer said very quickly, Justin, last time, uh, yesterday in the games, he has just massively jumped up in my standings just for those last couple plays in the last few games. Under pressure, like we said, first inter-regional uh, inter event, and he just nailed it under pressure and pulls off the play to win the game. What I love about him is that it feels like he's conditioning his opponent to play a certain way, and then he goes for the maximum punish in one game scenario that yes. can score a win for the entire team. I love it. He's always playing one certain duration, and then the 18 minute mark is, and he goes, what if I just switched it up a little bit and my team followed me up, and that's where they get to score. But the following, uh, in terms of the rest of his team, though, there is one player we should also mention, and that is Glaurom. Mm. The linchpin of this team, creating the roster, the one with interregional experience, he is a very good player, but some have accused him of maybe being a bit more ban-outable than his teammates, so maybe this is something that he needs to be careful of to make sure that his team gets him a hero he's comfortable on, or maybe he has just kept something hidden all the way up till this point. Oh, he's got five really good heroes, the Haka, Tyrael, uh, you know, there's a number of others. So he does have a fair amount. Uh, one interesting point to note as we go into this draft 
is that Team Dignitas, in all of their games so far, 100% have first banned Tassadar. And I was going to predict that that's going to happen again, but we can clearly see them already deviating from that. Yeah, and this is a ban, like we literally just said, that is a bit more focused against Glaurong with that Zeratul ban out, and forcing Team 8 to take out Tassadar instead. Li Ming is I'm making ticket here on the side, as well as Ragnarok, as my next guest. They run it on this battleground, they run it everywhere. What is it, like 17 games can total now Almost with all this of them. Western Clash? Oh my god. One thing to note here, guys, when you ban and pick this fast, that's a statement of dominance. They're both trying to assert that over each other. They haven't even given five seconds per hero pick. Oh, but this teammates is insane. altering here. They are just with rushing. their ban. They're <laughs> rushing straight for a teammate taking their time with the ban, though. But we already have dedicated heroes for a lot of people. Rack the Ross for Prisma, who we saw just absolutely dominant over the last couple of days. And however, another dominant and very scary hero pick. There's a tracer in the game, and we have Zalia, who we just mentioned could be that star power for the team. Yep, Zillia's come out to play here. I'm wondering what teammate wants to ban. Honestly, if it's my first round here, I'm thinking about the Jaina. We've seen Jaina already from Mania on this battleground when Li Ming's taken away. It's a second follow-up into, and just feel it out. Maybe if we get rid of the Jaina, what does Team Dignitas do when they don't have the mages they want? Do they go Kael'thas? That would be insane. So maybe they- It would be cool. It would be cool, but maybe they force him to play a little bit more of an auto attacker, and you can find out maybe we're a little bit better in team fights if suddenly we have to put Mene on an auto attacker, and that's the plan here for teammate. They have taken away Jaina. I like the direction. Yeah, Mene has played a number of different heroes this tournament so far. Nazebo, he's played Greymane, he's played Jaina. But it's clear that Jaina is his favorite go-to. Mm. So very clever ban there. And the Varian ban here is very noticeable. I think we might actually see a Diablo once again from teammate. It's great with Li Ming, good coordination overall. It gives you that engage that you want, especially against a character like Tracer. Uh, but I'm kind of wondering what we're going to see from Glarong. And this is usually where we see that pickup. Uh, Valera is a possibility. I think Valera could do fairly well against Tracer when you think yeah. about it. Mm. With a stun or even a silence. Might be a bit better than the last matchup they ran Valera, where they sort of run it into a Zeratul, which didn't work out in their favor because Void Prism is a pretty good ability. But Valera dropping a silence or a stun onto Tracer could give her his team the time to lock her down and kill her off entirely because Tracer's not going to see it coming as much, and Valera's a little bit faster than some other heroes. And she has a decent health pool too. If Greymane yeah. and Tracer were to jump on top of her, she could survive with the proper support compared to most yep. melee assassins. And the fact that she does have a heroic that allows her to escape from some of the heavy lockdown strategies the Dignitas like to go for. ETC coming in for Team 8, and a Rhaegar is going to be their support. So Glorong's choice will be allowed to counter whatever Dignitas picks up here. You initially mentioned the Grey Mane. I am on board with that 100%. We all know the reasons. He burns down Immortals. He's great with Tyrael. He's got that backline of Malfurion. He can help dive with Tracer. That's a sure and pick him for me, unless Dignitas wants to get pretty crazy in their draft. Speaking of Dignitas, they do need a hero now for Snitch, and they need one for Bakery. Uh, sorry, not for Bakery, they need one for JPL. JPL uh, material. let's see. Yes, there is, yes. Mene and Snitch. Some tracers. Snitch yeah. and Mene yes. still need their so hero. Both these, so two more assassins in theory, Snitch, although could be something a bit more varied, like maybe the Zarya, if they wanted to go all, Zarya, in, all in on Tracer. Zarya is possible for all in on Tracer, so is Abathur. Dignitas has been running a fair amount of yep. that. This isn't a hugely preferable map for it, but we've already seen it once in this tournament on this map in this the last series last day. All things that we <laughs> know are off the board. We've had a region from the ANZ do well. We've seen Abathur on this battleground. If Dignitas were to pull something out odd here, this is the choice. Arthas and Gul'dan oh. will be the choice here for Dignitas. So Gul'dan, obviously they're from Mene, and then and Snitch will be playing the Arthas. Now, normally, Zelia is the Arthas player, but with yeah. Racer being on the field, you do not dare not give that to him. No, Snitch should pick this up for Zelia here to make it so that they can give one of the best Tracer players in the world his hero. You want him to do well. And now, teammate, like you said, Glarong is probably going to be their last pick here. And what do you give it to him? The Greymane, like you said, still very strong. I still kind of like the Valera. I like the Valera. Man, an old-fashioned pick that he used to run back in the day was Stitches. And I wouldn't mind Stitches <laughs> against Gul'dan, uh, but you do run the risk of hitting Arthas. Valera is a little scary, I feel like, an Arthas, but doable. Is Medivh too crazy here? It gives... Nothing is too crazy for I, Team I would like it so cra Their entire draft strategy is, this is so crazy, it might work. I like it more than the Valera pick, actually. Just Arthas is scary. Tracer uh, can then follow up with reveal that Arthas brings in with the Z. Let's just say between Medivh and Greymane, anything else would kind of surprise me here. Yeah, I'd be damn with that. 
All right, let's see if we get the Grammy in here from is up. Team 8, Artanis. Oh. Okay, okay, this is surprising, but very viable here. They have good Immortal Race now with Lightning Bond if they wanted to on Rhaegar, the Artanis amateur opponent, the extra mm. attack speed from ETC. And they now have, similar to what you were calling with the Stitches, they have now a separation tool to try and catch that cooldown. Yep. I could barely disagree more. <laughs> okay. Artanis against Tracer is a nightmare. Uh, his immortal damage is okay, but not outmatching Greymane per se. It's difficult for him to go through Arthas and Tyrael. And even if he swaps, Tyrael can jump in and aid whoever gets uh, swapped. And he will find himself exposed against Tracer. I am very worried for this pick. I'd love to see it work. I'm a huge Artanis fan. I don't think it was a good one here. The logic I, is perfect, dude. I, I think if you take the Artanis route and you don't go for the God Swap strategy that all these players are trying to run, and you literally just focus on burning the Immortal and using Blade Dash to put a little bit of damage on Tracer, and then do swaps and people get near you, you're good to go. But yes, if you're trying to go for the Stitches approach of switching someone, Artanis will get burned down. I only want to see him on the Immortal, and I only want to see him in a spot where, like, okay, someone's out of position near me. Then yeah. I swap them. I don't want hyper aggressive Artanis. I want bruiser Artanis here. And what do you think? Suppression pulse to kind of reduce damage on the Immortal or laser for Malf or Gul'dan? I like laser on Gul'dan. Malf not so much because he can play around it. Gul'dan has to kind of have a slight start step with that cast on that Q. So laser can work, but I think you go with the suppression pulse because it's great in races. Well, we'll see if this Artanis pick is NA enough to net our NA team at Team 8 a victory over Team Dignitas. We're heading to the casting desk with Kaldor and Dreadnought. Thank you, Gilly. And we're going straight into game number one here in the best of five series with two left teammate with Prismaticism playing once again, of course, straight up. Uh, on the is right Ragnaros? Yeah, 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 there we go, sorry. The Yoda on Li Ming. We have Glorong on Atanis, Justin on ETC, and Butts on Rega. And here for Dignitas, we are going to see Snitch onto the Arthas. Again, with Zelia there on the Tracer, that's a must-have. JPL onto the Tyrael. Bakery, as always, on the support. Malfurion. Zelia on his legendary Tracer. And Mene, as always, going to be on the Gul'dan. I actually went over to Zelia and talked a little bit to him, and uh, I was just asking him if he thinks we're going to see him on his tracer again. And he was actually a bit frustrated. He said, like, everybody is spending it out against me right now. So he is extremely happy that he can play the hero again. Yeah, he pretty much has put on a clinic on how to run, you know, the tracer. The impact that he has on the game seems to be significant. He's kind of putting it lightly here. And, you know, looking at the drafts, Team A is, you know, the drafting relatively North American. Obviously, the Artana is coming out here. Uh, but into that double warrior between the Arthas and the Tyria, I can't help but feel like this is a very difficult composition to execute. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're completely right here. We talked a little bit about also the Gul'dan pick on the side of Dignitas. I feel like one of the reasons why we're even seeing this is that, especially with the Ragnaros, you can burn down that Molten Core trait so fast if you have a Gul'dan in your setup. So that might be something that Min is looking at. Oh. Yeah, but already the swap against JPL. The swap onto JPL here. He's going to lay down the smite, throw out the Eldruins. He is going to be just fine. Uh, Tyrael maybe not your best swap target, but that's going to be the first swap of the game here. And, it, you know, it's always fun when teammate gets on to the Artanis and the fact that, you know, Glorog, he's such an iconic player for this team, right? He's huge impact on a lot of those melees. And you thought his Zeratul was good. I mean, his swaps, I wouldn't say the rival, because let's be honest, his Zeratul is pretty insane. Uh, but his <laughs> Artanis is still really, really good. He actually showed his Artanis yesterday a couple of times already, and it was pretty impressive. The one thing that really stands out about Team 8 is how explosive they approach team fights. They really try and go for that early burst kill and that's something that also makes the swap that you were talking about just so dangerous because if it happens and you have the Ragnaros right there the ETC of course for this done then it's just lights out and but that's the most important part if it happens it's yeah. one of the harder tools it's very you know translated whenever the dash comes out it typically is gonna be very easy to dodge but when it hits it is a beyond impactful spell here uh, we do see now the Immortal phase coming out Team's playing very defensive, you know, looking for that posturing, and understandably so with Diggs' composition. Arth is on the defense, absolutely terrifying, and teammate picked a relatively racing composition, you know, they have the Artanis. Uh, with the attempt actually to lock down JPL here, but it failed. He jumps out of the sword. At the same time, now we have both teams trying to clear the lane so that at least get a level 4 advantage over the opponent. But a little bit of damage here. Snitch is all of a sudden caught trying to get away with his Arthas. There comes Justin, slides him down and takes the kill. And now it's going to be just one reset and an early pick here for Team 8. And it started again with the swap. Artanis, you know, he was rooted in place, so he didn't move that direction, but he was going to be drawing him back to join his team. Uh, you know, Glorong here, it can't stop now. He has to keep on point this entire game if, you know, they're going to be able to take out Dignitas because we've already seen Dig is not only 
Europe obviously being probably stronger, I mean, you can say just stronger at this yeah. point than North America, and then already taking out teammate in the series, it but can't it, stop now. I mean, I still have to say, like, yesterday after we saw Team A going into the top four, they were ecstatic. They are completely in heaven right now. They're in a situation in which they actually just said, Dignitas, just come on, we are going to take you down right now. Glorang, he's been talking about the drafting, he's been talking about how he feels that he has Maybe not figured out Dignitas, but he is much more solid in his approach regarding the draft towards them. And he just said, we're going to play to our strength, and I think we can beat them with that. And I think it's a pretty fair, you know, statement, especially when looking at Dig out of the European region, because they are by far the most predictable yeah. uh, when it comes to their value. And that's not just a temporary thing. That's not like, well, since Zelia is coming, that has been the history of Dignitas. They have been the most, you know, rinse and repeat when it comes to their drafts. The only difference is, is like, they've never been, you know, this lack of success with that type of drafting strategy. Also, one of the things that stands out about Dignitas is that they themselves said they have not reached their potential yet. They said, like, we're probably at 65% at this point. We still need to improve. A pickup of a new player has brought some new strength, but also, of course, a few new problems when it comes to the communication. So this is something that they still have to work on, and that might open just the opportunity for Team A to make oh, something happen here. Snitch getting caught out again, probably ah. from that swap, not going to be able to make it out here. And Team A is behind when it comes to the race, but they are netting themselves a couple of kills. Dig is doing a great job keeping up in experience, actually winning in the experience department, um, purely off this defense in that Arthas matchup into the Ragnaros. Uh, but the slow start, I think, is appealing here for Team A. They, you know, they love the slow beginning to BOE. It's probably their most dominant map, at least in the North American scene. And they love to, you know, they wait it out, they wait it out, and it's around that 10 spike is when they look to completely execute onto the Immortal. Yeah. The one thing that I have to also point out is that I feel for Team 8, it goes a little bit in their favor that NA has not been doing well against Europe so far this tournament. It's very easy to underestimate them here. And Dignitas is a team where we have seen in the past, not maybe to the extent of Fnatic, but emotions come into place by, um, with them as well. So if Team 8 can actually now start to just like, maybe take the first map, get a couple of kills, yeah, they could really open the door wide for potential victory. Yeah, and Dig there is going to back out and try and take the race, but obviously looking at the composition between Li Ming, Ragnaros, and most importantly, that amateur opponent on Glorong, uh, they in fact are not going to be able to take it. They are going to get a chase here on the Glorong, not going to hit the Howling, or not effective Howling Blast here for the team. Mortal's going to be moving in, and now we finally get to see, you know, what can teammate make yeah. happen here uh, after picking up the objective. Of course, one of the players that we have to look towards to is Zelia. He needs to show up for his team here. He needs to nearly show what he can do with his hero, with Tracer. After the first game on Tracer, he immediately said that he has like zero ping here, that it is a fantastic feeling to be on Tracer, and he needs to come through for this team here. But now it's Team 8's turn. They move through, they have the first Immortal, they break through the wall, and they start moving towards the fort, at least taking the well here. That was a very big route there from Bakery, and now it looks like Team 8 is gonna try and get a response Glorong is going to be in a tough spot. Zelia questioning if he wants to go in. There's going to be the spike. Gul'dan hits a huge... Oh, the swap actually <laughs> gives Glorong the distance, and he's going to make it out. That was a pretty cool move from Glorong right there. I really like that. He swaps out, and he would have moved straight back into Gul'dan. So that was an ex excellent move by him. Escapes, and for a moment, puts Zelia actually in a weird in a weird spot. And Zelia's like, oh, I didn't really expect that. And swaps out again. But yeah, that was a cool move by him. We've seen Glorong actually attempt a reverse swap twice. And what I mean by the reverse swap is essentially opening up with the E and then queuing backwards. Both are yet to really uh, be successful and actually yeah. make the connection. But when they do, debatably are the most impactful, you know, swap attempts from the uh, from the Artanis, purely based on the fact that it's just, you know, it's not only hard to dodge, but the positioning of where it puts not only the Artanis a little bit safer, but the opponent's equally, you know, crippled when it comes to their positioning after it lands. Yeah, Atenas, if played right, can do some beautiful swaps and absolutely brutal positioning. And that is something that also our analysts talked about. Especially that Gul'dan or the Malfurion are going to be in really awkward positions if they get swapped. They have to be on point. They really need to be careful and wait for Atenas, see what he does. But up here at the top, look at this. Once again, Ragnaros, extremely low, but no kill for Dignitas. Yeah, that was a huge moment. You know, if Prisma had gone down, that would have led to a front wall. A lot to be gained here for Dignitas and catch themselves up in experience, maybe winning that race now on to 10. Uh, now you see D Bakery and the rest of Dig is going to wait here on the Shaman, but Team 8, they're both going to be doing the exact same. So a very mirrored game 
No team going to be pulling ahead. But once the 10s come into play, I feel like that's going to change pretty quickly. Yeah, and both of the teams immediately, of course, also timing the camps here, making sure that they are just appearing on lane when the Immortals are on the board as well, forcing someone to deal with that in the long run. But for now, we're seeing actually our blue team, Team 8, trying to go for the Immortal, but immediately backing off as Snitch moves in from the side. Yeah, and this positioning is going to be beneficial. Actually, the Pulse Bomb there is going to connect, but not net a kill here for Dig. But the positioning is going to be complementary for a defensive posturing. And the fact that Dig went offensive looking for that kill has gotten a free clear here. While the Shaman is still pressuring out for Team 8, they are going to pick up those tens. But eventually, somebody's got to look towards bottom on the side of Dig, or that's going to gain a lot of value. Yeah, exactly. Like, that could really result in a drop forward. We have Purifier Beam also taken on the side of the Atanas. The Tens are in. And at the same time, we have, of course, now finally the option for Tyrael to drop that Sanctification. Yeah, the damage there that Team A's got is questioning, or making Dignitas kind of question the rotations. And now we see Team A actually moving on the defensive side. Gul'dan has shown on the bottom, forcing Team A to move up. Lorong is going to take a bit of damage. JPL there. So tanky on the tier, and there is going to be the Horrify and the Sanctification. Immediately going for Vatia, taking him down. Rega is gone, no support for Team A. Dignitas is on the chase here. Zelia is trying to run it down here. And we're having Dignitas immediately moving towards the opponent's Immortal, trying to get some free damage in. And we're going to see Dignitas do this over and over again. Again, they have such a good defensive team. They'll wait until you make the mistake. They will try and execute. And then, you know, you always look at Team A and you're like, yes, you have such an amazing race, but being down a man means you are, in fact, not going to be able to stand a chance here up against Dignitas. And this is something that Team 8 is actually afraid of, those mistakes being capitalized upon. They've been talking about this yesterday, and they... Oh, the mosh pit! And the hit against Malfuria, and then boom, Bakery is dead. They end up getting it, but also a reset here. Zelia, you know, he's sitting in the back. The Purified Beam went down, but he's going to make it out. Snitch is in a tough spot. Justing, not going to connect on the power slide. JPL goes in. Not too much mana. The Ancestral here is going to connect, and it looks like it's just going to be a one-for-one trade. Team A definitely giving Dignitas a run for the money right now, and they are both going again for those Immortal Dignitas moving away. But this is the damage that Team A needed, and it looks like they are going to pick up the second Immortal in a row. Yeah, and this is a huge moment for them to try and, you know, further the situation, or this lead that they're going to be able to obtain, because, again, Dignitas on the defensive. If, if Team A was not winning these Immortals, I feel like Dignitas is going to snowball so hard. They have so good siege. I mean, have you ever tried to defend into an Echo Corruption? Yeah. I mean, I mean, NA, by the way, it's almost <laughs> finishing. It's so difficult. Good is oh. so good. Again, the swap against Zelia, but he zips away quickly. At the same time now, that Immortal, of course, putting the pressure on. Arthur still down at the bottom of the map, trying to clear the waves here and gather some experience. But this push at the top lane is becoming a huge problem for them. It very much is. Purifier Beam's going to come up here in a couple of seconds. Moving up towards the keep. Arthas here, we see Snitch is looking for the flank. He does not have his heroic. They do have Horrify and Sanctification, though. They're going to go in. They're going to go in immediately, and they're trying to go for Li Ming here. But look at that potential kill that we see against But Rega is dead again. No support here. Mortal is still there. And we have the Purifier being on main and forcing him away. Li Ming is dead as well. It's a double kill for Dignitas going for three. And they're going to keep on the chase here, looking for more. That is going to be a two-man Howling Blast. Bakery with the follow-up. Rue Glaring's going to dash, but he returns right into his death there. Very well done from Dig. And huge shout out to Mene in that team fight. Every time they see Buds move up, he is going to drop the Horrified, force them into the team. And nobody's there to, you know, get the peel by the time because everybody sucked, stuck there, just CC'd with him. Huge plays here coming out from Mene. With that massive frontline setup that we're seeing for Team 8, Rega is such a crucial part of their composition. The heals are so important here, especially, of course, that panic button that you have with the cleanse, with the ancestral. And it's just not coming if you're able to take Rega down first. Yeah, and it's also crippled by the fact he went to the lightning bomb which we know is typically what you see when looking at this map it helps with your race potential but also then it's going to cripple the mobility when you're on the ghost wolf against somebody like mana you know typically when you have that increased speed you can kind of dance back and you just wait till your team gets initiated on then you move up you get the cleanse you drop the ancestral and suddenly you have a counter initiation uh not the case here though for this um for teammate yeah, they're picking up the level 13 talent now. In the early game, look looked good. They looked strong. They really did well. Got the early kills here. But that quad kill against them at the top lane, that really put a completely different twist onto the game now. Dignitas, all of a sudden, in the lead here. They took the fort at the top lane, lost their own. But now as the Immortal is spawning again, they are preparing their setup. They want to have another one of these team fights. And... Rega, he needs to stay farther in the back. They cannot get on him that easily. Absolutely. Buds has to be in a safe position in post Horrify. It's crucial for them if they're going to be successful because there's really... They have 
built a composition that is so offensive when it comes to the race itself, and Dignitas has invested so heavily on the defensive. Dignitas, honestly, their defense is better than teammates' offense. So then you think, well, let's inverse it. Does teammate move defensively? And honestly, it's so weak that I don't even think that is a winning situation. The best case is in this open territory where that scouting drone is exactly in that kind of open territory where teammate maybe uh, can look for those huge swaps. Oh, oh the kill oh. against Celia. That was beautiful. That was so well executed there. Lock him down, taking him apart, and this is exactly the problem. Great ice block on the side of Malfurion. Very well dodged here against the Atanas, but all of a sudden we have Justin running in again Tyrion with a sank on the ground and it's absolutely crucial in this downtime that teammate focuses onto the immortal that is what they're gonna do they bought a lot of heroics oh man that cool damn damage echo corruption getting a lot of value there uh but capitalizing on having Zelia down there and Justin with that power slide knocked right into the stun. Zaylee, you know, we talk about his tracer and how squirmy he can be at times. Huge punishment coming out here for Team 8. And now they have a small window where they need to force a fight before Dick hits that 16. Yeah, Dignitas at this point. They have Zelia back. He's not here just yet. Snitch, Snitch is looking for opportunity. There comes the swap, though. Snitch on the way back, already popping the army, of course, trying to get his hit points back as Justin is hitting. Nice, the yeah, Ancestral goes through. Well played here, keeping ETC in the game, but Tyrion has blown to pieces. Now they're looking towards Snitch. Good Root is going to zone off here. So Fear Smash goes down. Swap attempt is not going to connect. And it looks like Teammate now sets their eyes towards Zelia and possibly the Immortal here. Such a, another great initiation coming out from Teammate here. The Horrify, once it butts finally not connecting with that, being able to dodge that and hit the Ancestral, suddenly Teammate had that counter initiation we were talking about earlier. Yeah, exactly. ETC moves back, gets the heal. Artanis takes over in the meantime. ETC turns around and they really put the pressure on Dignitas. This is completely different from everything that we've seen so far between Europe and North America. NA is on the map. Yeah, Dignitas is maybe, you know, they're getting the silk and they've done well when it comes to their early game, but the fact that they're yet to get that objective is really going to hurt them. And teammate picking up the 16. They don't have necessarily the best Siegeing comp. Dig, obviously, with Mene, has a very good defending composition. We'll see if teammate in between this fort and this keep. I'd really like to see them try and force the fight pre-16. Yeah. Oh, oh the dodge again. Nice. He's on point with those. That's the second time now he was able to dodge the swap here. That would have been huge. Absolutely. It would have been, you know, teammate not only killing Bakery, but now looking towards getting that keep in their favor. We dropped the Molten Core there for Prismaticism just to increase the damage of the Immortal. 16 will picked up, be picked up on both sides, but it's crucial teammate does not overextend here. It's very easy for them to overextend between Arthas and Tyrael. There's no yeah. retreat if this gets bad. And let's not forget that we have Holy Ground now as well. So even more tools to zone here, and that is a huge problem. We still have cooldown with the Horrified. There it is. They're trying to go for right now. The lockdown, and down he goes. Beautiful play there. The Tyrael in with the Holy Ground, and then dropping, you know, the Horrified to split the teams here. And now what is what is teammate going to do? They have nowhere to run. This is what T Dignitas composition, if they're great at anything, it's going to be just chasing you down. And if there's no fort to run to, you are in fact just dead. And that is a three for nothing trade. Now Dignitas, the world is theirs, and they have set their eyes to get that top key. Yeah, they even ignored the Immortal who's still doing damage to the core, even took a couple of points off, but they are saying, guys, we killed three heroes. Top lane is ours. Look how far the wave already pushed in. We can take that and we will get a keep out of it. That is perfect decision making way on there. Especially considering they're yet to get the map objective. Where's the win condition come in if they are not going to be able, able to open up the keep? They can take another fight now and suddenly they, are, they have the option to pull the trigger and win this game. But without that, you know, it, it's unlikely they can bank on that immortal play. So Dignitas totally understanding their circumstances. They are adjusting appropriately in the middle of this game. It comes at a cost. It's 11 points on the core. Should he come to a race that might matter at this point? Not really the biggest deal. But of course, the next objective is going to be important here. Dignitas in the first game of the best of five series. A teammate really showing them how strong they currently are here. That team has really grown over the course of the tournament. It, 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 I mean... It, it, you begin to question when does it stop for teammate, right? Uh, they, uh, maybe they might not win this tournament, okay. But they, from the beginning of HTC to where they are now, it just they are yet to stop to grow and develop. They are the youngest team we have, or one of the youngest teams that we have, not only just in North America, but across all of HTC in all the regions. And now they're here representing North America as the top team and they're holding their own against Dig. And one of the things that what really fascinated me yesterday is how many problems they had sinking the heroic abilities and getting kills out of it and they still won the fights now just imagine if they just keep at it and have the perfect synchronization between those harmonize perfectly how dangerous this team can actually become it, it just uh, it's terrifying to even think of here you know but now we do have the immortal phase up 
Dignitas questioning if somebody's going to go clear that Shaman camp, they're going to be able to get the pick. Nobody on teammate is going to show themselves, and it is going to be an offensive positioning for this Immortal. Yeah, Zelia, he needs to be really careful here, and he definitely is. I mean, they're waiting for him. They're waiting for him to make one mistake to capitalize on it, take him down once again, turn it into four versus five. Team eight is starting to siege up here, and Dignitas is in a defensive position right now. Cam's pushing the top, pushing the bottom together with the catapult. Yeah, the catapult, both of them have no keeps, right? So it's just A, the catapult the most. The Shaman Camp itself actually typically just dies onto the core because of that splash damage. The wolves move in, or the dogs move in, and they get killed uh, into the Shaman. So it's mostly who has the most catapults being escorted uh, by that Shaman Camp. But with Gul'dan pulling out, it looks like there's going to be an attempt of initiation but overall, just going to drop, you know, a little bit of damage and play their own game. I mean, both of them have to really react to the situation on the map, and that's what they're doing. They're stunned, on the other hand. That's a problem. All of a sudden, an opportunity. The mosh pit once again. Tyrion jumps in with a sack. Well done, but Arthur still dying. And immediately, we have one more. Oh. Atan is dropping his ult on Malfurion. The swap again. JPL is going to get power slided on. It looks like he, in fact, is going to fall here. A 2 for nothing trade. And... Wow. Warong just used that stun as a retreat. He was dead if yeah. he didn't get stunned. That dash into the stun, in fact, <laughs> saved his life, gave his team the positioning, and then they got the counter initiate. The Horrify being used here. Zelia in trouble. The swap and the kill. And down they go. Three heroes dead on the side of Team Dignitas. And we have Team A going straight for the Immortal here. Dignitas actually opening this up, seeing opportunity for them as we have the immortal stun Artanis, and then it turns around as we have that beautiful mosh pit. JPL does everything he can. He tries to drop the Sanctid, but he doesn't hit Arthur's. Arthur's dies, and from that point on, it's just a cleaning job, especially since Gul'dan was just not there to help them out. And now we have Team 8 here with a 100% shielding on the immortal. Only one keep left up for Dignitas. Honestly, I thought Team 8 would just go bottom and pressure with the catapult, say, you're going to lose the keep it'll eventually make it to the core but it seems like they're gonna play a little bit safer they knew the catapults on top you know they don't want to risk that oh my goodness we lost the fight and suddenly we're taking core damage so safer play here still gonna be a terrifying situation dignitas has to play flawlessly if they are not going to lose the game here. They need to wait a little bit longer. 20 seconds until they have Horrify back, and that's going to play a huge role here. If one of Team 8 moves a little bit too far forward, Gul'dan will be able to isolate him. That's something they're looking for right now. But this keep is so important at this point. And look at the level bar, the experience bar here. Both of them so close to hitting 20, but Team 8 is pulling ahead. JPL there just dropped the Holy Ground. It's going to give them a little bit of free damage onto the Immortal Shields now slowly dropping. There's going to be a root onto Artanis. Glorion is going to drop the dash. He's going to be fine for now, but there is the swap attempt. The fear bomb is going to be dropped. And immediately, the Malfurion ult, and it's a double kill. We go for Ragnaros. The heal is in as Butts is dropping the Ancestral. JPL trying to isolate him with a quick holy ground here. The Immortal went through the keep and moves to Koa. Still with a lot of hit points, not able to break through the shields. But that was a beautiful combo on the side of Team Dignitas, ending in a magnificent magnificent silence on the side of Bakery. It truly feels like if Dignitas, you know, if they have the cooldowns that they need and they're in comfortable positioning when it comes to the map, that they are com they have perfect initiation. That a lot of the times teammate doesn't really have the tools necessary to be able to deal with it. It's when teammate brings in uh, what I would like to call a little bit of the NA factor, the chaos <laughs> of a team fight. When we don't approach it in such a calculated manner, it does feel like Dignitas doesn't know quite what to do in these fights. And I think Artanis is implementing that a little bit, you know, with you know the sweet disengage that he got onto the stun, a couple of the swaps making Dignitas and forcing Bakery to drop a lot of ice blocks in this game. Yeah, now we have the Storm Tullets in play though, and this is going to be a really interesting part because we have a lot of survivability on the side of Team 8. I mean, talking Rhaegar, talking Artanis, we also, of course, on the side of Ragnaros here. So it's going to be much... Yeah, much more difficult for Dating to get these kills that they got so far. Yeah, and now with the double catapults, who's going to go out of their way to be able to get the clear? A lot of that's going to yeah. be on Mene. He's their initiator in most of these fights. So suddenly, if teammate is proper with this abuse of the catapults and just raw, you know, winion pressure they have on this map, I really do think that it is their game to lose at this point. Dignitas has to find an answer, and I think it's going to be just catching Team 8 out somewhere onto the map. I could absolutely not agree more. At this point, Team 8 is in the lead. They have two keeps down. They might be behind in kills, but at the end of the day, it's all about that core, and this one is going to be pressured all game long by the lanes right now. Dignitas is going to try to look for a mistake that they can completely exploit, maybe get an isolation kill, and Team 8, if they have the discipline, 
to really just like stay safe right now, wait for the opportunity. They should be able to bring this home. But let's see, Dignitas, they're trying to go for the fight. He has the swap that doesn't have Garong at all, but the Ancestrality does. It does land, but it, Garong is still in a terrible position there. Prismatism is on the retreat, one man down already. Justin ends up dropping the mosh pit, but sadly that dance is going to lead to his own death in a matter of seconds. Prismat trying to keep himself up, goes for the submerge. Is he gonna make it out? Yeah, that's not gonna happen here at all. It's a triple kill and Dignitas, they throw this game wide open. There's a big camp at the bot lane going towards the core, but they will be able to deal with it. And at the same time, JPL isn't done chasing them. Just look at that root. Perfect root by Bakery. JPL with a holy ground, and they get another kill against Li Ming. They could have gone for core here. They're still doing it. Yeah, the idea, I think, there with was trying to buy as much time as possible for Yodo. Try to yeah. buy that time. Bud's is going to go look towards the core, but, you know, such a proper response on the side of Dignitas. They get the pick, <laughs> and now there's no hope. I respect the attempt here, Buds, but this is going to be Dignitas taking game number one. The B-step there. That is just put the top in it. Guys, we have a GG as Team Dignitas turns it around and takes game number one against Team 8 in an intense first game of the Best of Five series. Yeah, and I, I really feel like if we see a less, little less North America, specifically the Artanis, out of the drafts of Team 8 here, I think they have a shot because Dignitas played just an overly defensive, very much them strategy, but it, it's counterable. We see this already from Team A. It is very standard. It's standard, standard, standard on the side of Dignitas. And if we get a little weird flavor from uh, the rest of Team A here, we might have a f game five series. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the one move of Atanas there, moving into a really awkward position and being surrounded immediately by Dignitas members, him actually swapping someone didn't do him any favors because all of a sudden he was body blocked as well. So that was a death that was 100% certain we saw, of course. And also Justin moving back, trying to delay it with the marsh pit, but there was nobody to really come in and help him. But that was the moment where we really thought Team 8 could win this and they were in a commanding position actually. Yeah, and I think a lot of the map choices are important here for Team 8 in the rest of the series as well. If they can get a map, less maps like Infernal Shrines, which conveniently enough is actually both of these teams' favorite maps, but some of the more skirmishy, maybe even moving on to, you know, Cursed Hollow is a, a unique one here that Team 8 at times has mixed results, but I think just try to catch Dig off guard. And yeah. I think it can start not only with the draft, but even in the map phase. They definitely showed the potential in this first map, but well, before we head into game number two, we are, of course, going to hear once again what our analysts have to say about game number one. Exceptional plays in that first game of our series, but although Teammate did very well with the race, they had a lot of Immortals. Grubby, it seemed like Team Dignitas just had the perfect response to any push. I mean, I'm very impressed by both teams here. Dignitas' response was defense, and they did it well. They're a very methodical team, and their experience showed in the course of this game. I think both Dignitas and Trixler, myself, and probably you guys, were just flabbergasted by the skill and the play of Artanis. I'm a big Glaring fan here, and he played Artanis really well. Yeah, that was the best Artanis of the HGC so far. Yes. By far. Uh, I've been very disappointed with a lot of Artanis that I've seen in both Europe and North America, and that one right there was impressive. It's sad to see the loss actually come out, but it makes sense. It's Dignitas. That's what Dignitas does so well. They get isolation. They're great at defense, as you mentioned earlier. The Holy Ground that we saw earlier was fantastic for the kill. Now, here's a fight that we're seeing from early on. This was a Glorong where he actually blade dashed back to use a stun from the Immortal to survive the kill, and his team turned around and actually got into a fight. So solid fights overall by Team 8, but of course, the one that matters is the one at the end game. Isolating the Artanis and getting killed was spectacular by JPL in particular. And I want to stress how flexible Snitch is for Team Dignitas. Not only is he as flexible as probably playing more than 50% of the entire hero's roster, but he plays them well. And this just really impresses me. Anything from the Haka, to Zarya, to Range, Vala, and then like Arthas as well. Always very, very solid. Tetra, we're gonna take a look at that last team fight, but you and I were very really complimenting Bakery as well for his great plays in that game. Yeah, Bakery was doing it really well. His icebox to try and prevent himself from getting swapped by Artanis was great. But like we said, this is the issue with the Artanis. If you are not in the best position, you're gonna get separated and you're gonna get burst down. There is no escape in Bakery, as we saw there, with the perfect Twilight Dream to just ruin any help Ragnaros could offer there. It was a beautiful fight by Dignitas, and that's all they need to win the game. Bot lane was already under pressure from both uh, from Team A, but it didn't matter because Dignitas, they're fighting in the top lane. They're right next to where they need to go. 
The holy ground in particular was the important moment there. JPL finding where to get that engagement. And they fainted the pressure on the bottom left on the Ragnaros. And then once he actually started that indication, everyone was mounted and ran straight up to the top right corner. And they burned everything to kill Artanis. Because Artanis had shield surge, he had phase bulwark, and he also had force of will. If he gets down to a quarter health and you do not CC him and kill him there, he will live throughout the entire fight and eventually beat you down. So Dignitas realizing that threat went all in on the Artanis and it worked out for him. Now, that was the battleground choice of Team 8. They wanted to go to Battlefield of Eternity. That's where they had beaten Team Dignitas before. Do you guys feel like that's going to be the tip top of how Team 8 approaches this series, or do they have more up their sleeves? Well, you know, I think Dignitas is methodical, and they did lose here before, but they've already shown a little bit of change. They had banned, out of the eight or nine games they played, they banned Tassadar in first rotation every time. They've banned Zeratul now, which, since they're methodical, this could just be a tactic that they employ throughout the entire series. Uh, Team 8, though, through 12 different first bands, they had nine different ones. So they are very adaptive, and I think they could adapt to Dignitas on another map. Well, Dignitas able to withstand the pressure on Battlefield of Eternity. We'll see if they can continue their run in this series right after this. of this new realm already fear me. They should. So many souls for me to harvest. And I shall begin with this. This nexus, all its power, it will be mine. Those who oppose me invite their own demise. And if the two of us have learned anything fighting fools like these before, is that when we work as one, none can stand against us. We are Shogun. We will rule the Nexus or destroy it. <laughs> Experience has taught the Protoss that when we do not fight together, we die alone. That we shall not see defeat this day. For we stand as one. Our differences will not divide us, but make us stronger. Together, we will defend the Nexus with honor and earn our glory. I am Hierarch Artanis, leader of all Protoss. And in unity, there 
is strength. Hold on to hope. It will not abandon you. <laughs> <laughs> 